people, let's proceed. The positive thing about all these dikes in the Netherlands is that if you look in the grass along the roadside in summer, usually you can see a rich diversity of plants and also insects. It's a little bit inconvenient to stand along the roadside, but you know what? I'm going to take the opportunity to take at some semi-urban wildlife down here. When I say a lot of butterflies and insects, this is what I mean. Look at it. It's attracting a lot of pollinators. If you're in the Netherlands, it's worth checking the roadsides if they are unmowed along the dike, because there's a great variety of wildflowers once in a while. Oh, look. It's not one, but two tortoise shells. Can you see both of them feeding on the plant in this frame? First, I'm going to use my net to identify some of the butterflies here. And then secondly, I am going to identify some of the plants that are attracting these butterflies. I'm going to do it in that order. First the insects, then the plants. Let's see if we can find anything. This should be easy. Yeah. Already got two butterflies. Let's identify butterfly number one. Don't worry, all the butterflies are released. This is literally one of the most common butterflies in the world. Pires rapai, the small cabbage white. The small white will readily lay eggs on both cultivated and wild members of the cabbage family, such as charlock and hedge mustard. In the larval stage, the small white can be considered a serious pest on cultivated cabbages, kale, radish, broccoli and horseradish. The larva is considered a serious pest for commercial growth of cabbage. The species is found almost globally in temperate climates, from Russia to Asia to North America to Europe, the Middle East and parts of Australia even. It seems to be absent in the tropical regions, however, such as South America or tropical Africa. As I promised, all the butterflies are released. Bye, little one. Let's check the next one that I caught. Hmm, interesting. To the naked eye, they all look like generic white butterflies, but if you look closer, you find that actually they are a mix of several different species. And here we have the green veined white, Pires napi, a cabbage feeding species that feeds on relatives of the cabbage family too, like cuckoo flower, mustard, watercress, radish and more. It's easy to distinguish because the wings indeed have green veins on the underside. It seems that Pires Nape uses cultivated cabbage more rarely and it, it is preferring to use wild relatives of the cabbage family instead, making it a less important pest species than the other species I showed before. Who would have guessed that all these tiny white butterflies are actually all different species? I do, because I'm the expert of course. Just kidding. But there's another species I haven't shown you before. It's one of the largest ones and one is flying.
close to me right now. I don't know if this is even going to work. <gasps> oh, I got it. I literally just got it. This is the biggest pieces. Let me show you. Huh? Another species of cabbage, right? That's right, and this one is very big compared to the other species. Open your eyes and you'll see nature is much more diverse than we often expect. This one is known as Pyrus brassica, or also the large white. It's easy to tell apart because they are much larger than the rest. The large white is common throughout Europe, North Africa and Asia. Interestingly, it seems almost absent from North America. You would have expected such a widespread pest species to have reached the United States ages ago, but they haven't. At least not for most part. This species loves to breed in vegetable gardens, because just like its cousins, it loves to lay eggs on cabbages, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, kohlrabi, rapeseed, sweet and turnip. The attacks to crops are rather localized and can sometimes even lead to 100% crop loss in a certain area. In addition, because of its strong inclination to migrate, adults may infest new areas that were previously free from attack. Because many of the house plants of Pyrus brassica are sold for consumption, damage by these butterflies can cause a great reduction of crop value. Interestingly, the species is also capable of migrating very large distances. Three species! Three species of white butterflies! The next time you see generic looking butterflies, make sure to take a close look. A lot of people assume that all of these butterflies are just the same because they have the same color. But if you look closer, you'll actually see nice and interesting differences. And now it's time to let it go. Bye my friend. I love you. All the butterflies on this channel are totally unharmed. I'm experienced, I know how to handle them. If you don't believe me, check my other videos. I made over 1500 butterfly and moth breeding videos. I did conservation of insects in Brazil and much more. I know what I'm doing. These insects are not damaged or harmed for my video. I'm just educating you about them. All right, people, I think I'm going to stop catching these guys now. In just five minutes, five minutes, I caught like a dozen of them. If you ever come to the Netherlands, one of the first things that you will see is dozens and dozens and dozens of these white little butterflies. But why? Why are these butterflies so common? Well, that's actually an entomological puzzle that I'm going to explain to you. You see, there is something interesting about these Pyrus species, yeah? I like to call them the pigeons or the rats of the butterfly world. You see, these species, these Pyrus butterflies, are specialized in consuming plants of one particular family, Brassicacea. Now, I don't know how much you guys know about botany, but the Brassicacea family plants includes plants like mustard, but also plants like cabbage. It's basically the cabbage family. And it just so turns out that humans are really, really, really fond of cabbage. So why are these Pyrus species so super common? The answer is humans! These butterflies absolutely thrive in human, human influenced environments. That's because these insects specialize, it's the caterpillars that is, the caterpillars pretty much specialize in eating cabbage and any plants from the cabbage family. And it just so turns out that everyone is planting these in their garden. But even more than that, humans have spread these butterflies all across the globe. 
In fact, many of the places where you can find Pyrus butterflies are places where they are not native. Places where they were introduced by humans. And that's why I like to call them the pigeons of the butterfly world, because there's a lot of species that thrive in urban and human settlements. And these species have been transported across the world because of humans. And are thriving because of humans. And pigeons are an example of that. Pigeons have been spread across the globe by humans. So have rats, cockroaches and a number of other species. Anyway, I'm going to release them now. This is gonna be fun. Woo! So many butterflies! Ciao guys! Oh my god! Oh! That was all of them. That was fascinating. If you ever come to the Netherlands, you're going to see these butterflies. I'm not joking, like every five minutes. They are super common and they are supposed to be. But the reason for them being common is humans. And I suppose the presence of these butterflies doesn't necessarily mean that the environment is doing well. It means there's a lot of humans nearby. So, it's, this species is associated with uh, pretty much human disturbance of the environment in some way. Despite it, it's interesting to see them. Let's move on, there's more butterflies here that I can show you. Just a little biology lesson about Pyrus butterflies. They're really after our vegetables. Are the Russians finally invading? I'm not sure what's happening. Guys, I hope you learned to speak Russian. I think uh, Putin is finally coming to the Netherlands. Ты говорит по русски, да? Я изучаю русский язык, потому что никто не может говорить в моем языке, да? See, I'm ready. It's probably just a test, I hope. I hope. And here we have a stray holly blue, or Calestriana archaeotis. It's one of the most polyphagous species of blues in Europe. Their host plants are numerous and include Ilex or holly, Eronimus, Ramnus, Robinia, Genista, Spartium, Asalagus, Rubus, Erica, Pyrus, Hedera, and many other species. Or if you're more familiar with the plants, this includes things like common ivy, heather, Bramble, holly, and a lot more. Now guys, I'm really happy to see these right now. This is Aglaïs urtique, the small tortoise shell butterfly. But this butterfly, it um, had an issue. 
this butterfly used to be one of the most common species that you could see in my country, the Netherlands. But since the past 10 years they have really strongly declined. I'm not sure on the statistics on how much they declined. I have to download uh, the, the scientific paper that I read a while ago again. But I think their decline was as much as 90%. That's very concerning. And that's sad because this is a beautiful species. But in this world there is a lot of butterflies that are endangered, that are already declining. But in some way it's even more concerning when a very common species that was actually thriving declines by like 90%. And I can confirm that in my childhood these butterflies were exceptionally common. But since the last few years it's, it has really been a struggle to even see a few individuals. So why is this happening? Well, there's a few theories. The first theory is that um, it's due to a parasite. Basically, there is a parasitic fly that is expanding its range. And it's sad that these butterflies, uh, especially their caterpillars, are so affected by the parasite that it's decimating the species. Another theory is uh, the fact uh, that climate change is making the summers in Europe hotter and drier and this species is not really resistant to that. Who knows what's going on? A combination of parasitism, climate change or maybe it's all those things at once you know it's like the death by, death by a thousand cuts that's very unfortunate. But this year I've been seeing more tortoise shells than usual so maybe they are finally having a good year. Hmm. Of course, we are releasing it. <whistles> Bye, friendo. Alright guys, so what is this plant with the beautiful uh, purple-blue flowers that's attracting so many insects? Well, that's interesting. This is called alfalfa. Medicago sativa. I think sometimes it's also referred to as lucerna. But the interesting thing is that um, alfalfa or Medicago sativa First of all, it's a Fabaceae plant. Um, that means it is from the pea family and the clover family. Uh, but the, also the other interesting thing about it is supposedly this plant is not native to Europe. They think that a long time ago this plant was first cultivated in Central Asia in countries like Iran. But for thousands of years this plant has been grown in Europe as livestock fodder. That's right. So this plant was pretty much uh, imported as livestock fodder. I think even the ancient Romans and Greeks were already cultivating these plants. So despite being introduced they have been in Europe for a long time. But technically it's not a native plant. But pollinators they go crazy for alfalfa. They go mad for it. And I believe even today this uh, plant is still grown as fodder for like dairy cows or um, to harvest hay for hay production to feed uh, livestock like sheep, cows, cattle. So yeah, this plant has an interesting relationship with uh, humanity. We definitely helped propagate it around the world. And now it's just thriving in the wild in the Netherlands I suppose. So this video really shows the influence that humans have had on nature because a lot of the species we encounter so far we've concluded their presence is really propagated or boosted or influenced by humans. <coughs> wow guys, I just spotted a hummingbird hawk moth. Macroglossum stellatarum and she is laying eggs on the gallium. On the bed straw. We are lucky.
So what are these purple flowers here? I don't know if you can see them. Should we pick one? I don't like to pick flowers, it's bad for nature. Okay, just one, okay, for this educational video. So this is a flower from the genus Centaurea, also known as knapweed. I'm not even sure which species of knapweed this is because um, my botany game is not that strong. I cannot na name all the species from the top of my head. I'm trying my best here. Um, this seems to be a flower that does attract pollinators, although you don't see butterflies on it that often. Sometimes you see bumblebees and stuff on it though. But it is one of the plants that I suppose does attract pollinators in some extent, although the majority of butterflies in this little meadow here, they seem to be really more interested in the uh, alfalfa. But bumblebees, they love this. I bet if we look around, we... Oh, see? There are some bumblebees already arriving. They love this stuff. So not everything is about butterflies. If this plant is good for bumblebees, it supports other types of insect, right? Now this plant here with the small yellow flowers is actually in the Netherlands also a really important meadow flower. This is called bird's foot trefoil, Lotus corniculatus. It's an amazing plant for insect pollinators such as bumblebees. But more importantly in the Netherlands there is one species of butterfly it is pretty much exclusively associated with Lotus corniculatus and exclusively uses it as a host plant. Can you guess what species it is? It's the Icarus blue, Poliomatus Icarus. And there is a chance that if we look around in this meadow we can actually see a few specimens of this butterfly. Their association with this plant is very strong. It's, in the Netherlands, I believe, it's their only host plant. I know they can use a bunch of other host plants, sometimes um, Coronilla, I believe, or one of its relatives. It's a Fabacea plant, that means it's a relative of clover, of peas. It's in the same family as the alfalfa that I just showed you. And I'm pretty sure that if we look around, there's a few specimens of the Icarus blue butterfly here as well. Because if you see this plant, then you see the Icarus blue. Oh look, it's our old friend, the Icarus blue butterfly, Poliomatis Icarus. We've seen this one many times. Sadly, my footage is a little bit blurry and shaky. Sorry, guys.
Yep, told you guys, didn't I? If you want to see the Icarus Blue, all you have to do is find a meadow with wildflowers that has this yellow little plant. You're pretty much guaranteed to see them. They love it. Now what's interesting is on the other side here, uh, behind this little road here on the dike, there's an area with more rocky terrain. And rocky terrain means different plants. And different plants means different insects because, well, plants and insects are strongly intertwined. Oh, there goes a peacock butterfly. I should film that one too, if we get the opportunity. So let me turn the camera. Oop. This is a very Dutch video. Bikes and dikes. Huh? So, so this is a more rocky area, can you see it? So that means maybe different plants and maybe some different butterflies, who knows? We'll see. Something that not many people know is that the Netherlands actually has wild succulents. Yes, that's right, the Netherlands has succulents, but you can only see them on the most dry and rocky terrains most of the time. See this stuff? This is called white stone crop. Sedum album. And I just thought that fact was fascinating. Folks, I think, I think that was it for this area. Let's move on.
right folks, I'm gonna tell you the planning for today. This hill here has a nice amount of wild flowers. We're gonna check it out, but first I'm gonna have some lunch because I'm starving. And maybe we're gonna have a conversation. Do you enjoy that? Conversations? Or are you just here just only to see the insect? Sometimes I like to talk a little bit to YouTube and vent. Some people don't like it, some people do. We're going to see if my audience likes it. Then I'm going to this city where I grew up in. It's called Teal. And recently they built a butterfly garden in Teal. Now when I say butterfly garden, I don't mean like a tropical butterfly garden. I mean an outdoor garden. They built like an outdoor park with flowers specifically for insects and it's supposed to attract a ton of butterflies. I don't know if that's true, but if that's true, it's going to be perfect for my channel. First, let's have some lunch. Ooh, I like this road and I already see, oops, I already see tons of butterflies here, like ridiculous amounts. And that's good. After I eat my food, we're definitely gonna butterfly hunt here a little. Oh my, this is perfect. This is perfect. Let's find a nice spot to sit and talk. I was on my way to have lunch, but I saw something interesting. Beautiful purple flowers. Now, what do you think these flowers are? These are the flowers of thistles. That's right. A lot of people like to think um, of thistles as harmful and annoying weeds. That is not true, my friend. Thistles are amazing plants for insects. Amazing plants for wildlife, pollinators and butterflies. Just look at the butterflies sitting on these thistles, it's amazing. grassy little hill. Already seen some peacocks though. So there's some butterfly activity but I don't like how windy this place is. It's a bit too windy. Butterflies don't like that. Well, let's see. This is not really nature. Well, it is nature but it's like a kind of really urbanized area. Like here we have a lateral industry and housing, so it's kind of like a park. 
Aha, more thistles, huh? That means more butterflies. Yep. How many peacock butterflies can you count? Look very closely, it's a quiz. Come on, how many peacock butterflies do you guys see in this shot? The answer is there's four of them, if you look closely. Maybe I should bring out my net and catch them for fun. Lunch is delayed, I'm distracted. Let's see if we can swipe some of them up. Yep. Gotcha. Wow. Okay, this is just crazy. In only a few minutes! I caught this many peacock butterflies. I feel like it's time to let them go because they're getting agitated. Sorry guys. Let's let you go. There you go. Be free. Woo. Man, do some of you want to post for me on YouTube? No? No? Okay. Bye then. Oh, this one still wants to sit still. Do I really have to explain the biology of the peacock butterfly to you? Because we made so many videos of this species on my channel already. It's getting repetitive, isn't it? Alright, one more time. So this species it lays its eggs on stinging nettles. Uh, stinging nettle is a very common weed in the Netherlands, so this species has always been stupidly common. But this year they're like double stupidly common. I don't know why, There's, the peacock seems to be having a really good year. Like I said, it was always one of the most common species in my country, which is good because they are beautiful. But their numbers seem to have exploded this year and uh, I'm ready for it. So yeah, they usually I think they have like um, one to two broods a year most of the time. They hibernate as adults and my legs are really itchy from the grass for some reason. Let's move on. All right, nothing too special apart from a crazy amount of peacocks. Hey, a bench. That's where we are going to have lunch. But first, I see some thistles in the distance. Wanna bet that there's peacocks on it? Oh man, this area is infested with peacock butterflies, dude. I told you, take a look. Here's two of them, here's another one of them. Unfortunately it's very windy, it's ruining the shot. But take a look how many peacocks there are, dude. They are so common this year. They're everywhere. So what's Bart Coppens having for lunch? A lot, because I'm fat. In the Netherlands these are very popular. This is called a frikandel broodje. Yeah, that's right. Dutch people are probably laughing right now. These things are mega popular in the Netherlands for some reason. They're basically junk food. And they're filled with what's like a minced meat hot dog. That we call a frikandel in Dutch. And the frikandelle itself is actually, a, I think it's a traditional snack from like the 17th century, believe it or not. Good, good, good. A 
it's like minced meat with herbs, spices, onion, and they usually add curry sauce. It's difficult to describe the taste. It's not a, it's not a cul culinary experience. It's kind of like low-level junk food, but hey. Dutch people and their frikandel broodje are inseparable. I must say I like nature, but after going to the rainforest in Brazil, looking around in the Netherlands, uh, I mean, in Brazil I, there was like uh, over a thousand species of butterflies. In the Netherlands we have like 55 species of butterflies, so yeah. In Brazil there's at least 20 times more species. Um, of course that doesn't make the Netherlands inferior. Every environment is different and I don't think it's, it's okay to think of one environment as superior to another one. Every environment is important in its own respect, of course. But hey, you know, I, I feel a little bit spoiled at seeing so many new species. And now I'm in the Netherlands, I'm walking around and I'm just seeing all the species I've already seen before. In the Netherlands there's actually a few species of butterflies I have never seen. But they are far away from where I live. Uh, I would need to, need to travel a little bit. I would love to see actually the um, Purple Emperor, Apertura Iris for YouTube, that would be interesting. Or Lycaena disparbatavus, the large copper butterfly, but it's far away from where I live. It would be amazing to make a video of those, though they are really pretty. That is not all, ladies and gentlemen, because I am a fat bastard, a fat grazing bastard. So I also have here a sandwich with Dutch Wapenaar cheese. What is Wapenaar cheese? Well, it's a Dutch type of cheese. It has salty crystallized parts in it. And it's also kind of creamy. Wow, look at me, I'm becoming a food reviewer over here. But yeah, the flavor is kind of salty, creamy and nutty. Ooh, blah, 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 blah. nutty. Mm -mm. So, so lately I feel a little bit anxious. This may be a little bit personal. But a lot has happened over the last few years. The current year I'm filming this is 2022, if you're watching this in the future. But we've just been through a pandemic. And now there is a war in Ukraine. Russia decided to annex Ukraine for some reason. And then there was an economic recession. And then there's more unrest, like, I don't know, women's rights essentially being attacked in the United States of America, even though I don't live in the USA. <clears throat> All of those things combined, they bother me, you know. I'm an old fuck, I'm almost 30 years old, and now I look very young and sexy. But I've been through some shit before. I went through like, um, remember the crash of Wall Street? Remember 9-11? Remember the war in Iraq? I remember. I lived through that shit. Not personally. And uh, I mean, I'm somebody who lives in Europe. So compared to people living in America who may be more affected by this kind of stuff. Not necessarily though, like the, some of this is just global. The rise of 
rhetoric that I don't know promotes well how do I describe it it's just like I have the feeling that uh, we're on a dark path right now humanity is kind of on a dark path like I don't feel like things are improving and it's anxious to live with the feeling that the future the future may not get better but worse you know that's depressing it's depressing to grow old in a world that you feel like is going downhill. Now I know things like war, since society's very conception have been a part of humanity, I think humanity has had war for as long as we have had societies. And maybe I had the naive delusion, delusion that we would finally reach a point where we move past that kind of bullshit. It's funny because if you ask the average person on the street and you ask them, hey, do you like war? Do you support war? Pretty much 99% of them will say no. I don't like war, I don't support war. So why does it keep happening? It's something nobody likes and something only very few benefit from. But maybe that's the problem. It's those few who benefit from it, isn't it? And then there's things like pollution climate change don't tell me it isn't a problem I traveled around the world I've seen the forest with my own eyes I've been in the world's most deforested rainforest okay I've been in Asia Cambodia South America I've worked in Brazil I've been to the Caribbean I've seen it I've seen what happens to the environment. It's fucking depressing. And it's fucking sad. Everything just feels like it's going downhill lately, you know? It's not a world I want to grow up in. It feels like technology and science they became way too advanced and we don't really deserve to have them because we just abuse them despite modern science people still believe in false information despite modern science people still believe in conspiracies people still fight and kill each other over made up gods People still fight each other over magical thinking and delusions. Like, it doesn't matter how advanced society becomes. It doesn't matter how advanced our technology becomes. This rotten monkey brain is never going to improve. You can improve computers, but we can't improve our brains. Well, maybe that's not true. Maybe we can improve our brains, but that's a whole different discussion, isn't it? It feels like authoritarianism is going to dominate. Whether you grow up in the United States, Russia or China or Europe. It feels like on every continent there's people out there to fool us and mislead us to reduce the wages, to reduce the taxes, to exploit people more and more, to increase the difference between the rich and the poor even more 
increase the income disparity to obtain power to overthrow democracies. Man, it's depressing. But I'm just one man with a YouTube channel about butterflies. What can I do? Nothing. I wasn't... Well, that's not true. I can do something. But not enough. Best thing I can do is talk about it. In front of a tiny audience. But I'm just concerned, man. I don't want to grow up in a world where people choose financial gain over the environment, where there will be nothing left for future generations until we reach the breaking point. But then it will be too late. I don't want to grow up in a world where presidents are 70 or 80 or 60 years old go to your fucking retirement home stop trying to determine the future for young people if you are a fucking dinosaur who grew up like who grew up in a time you had to fuck someone instead of using the internet like these people are stuck in a cold war mentality every US president Chinese president, a Russian president, you name it. Even many European leaders are just so old. You're stuck in a cold war. Really my only hope right now is the new generations, is the young people. I don't have faith in the older generations and I'm not sure if I have faith in my generation. But I've talked to the young generation and they seem much more aware seem much more aware of their environment. They seem much more respectful. I'm not sure if that's true, but that's what it seems like to me. I know people like to make fun of trends like TikTok, but you know what? Every generation has its trends. Young people, if you are watching this, man, you are... You are our only hope. Because we fucked it up. fucked it up. People shouldn't have to pay thousands of dollars to get medical attention. People shouldn't have to work two fucking jobs to afford, afford a shitty small apartment. I'm rambling, I'm just thinking, maybe I shouldn't, it's ruining my mood. It's difficult, it's also difficult for me. You know, all my life I just want one thing, that's to play with butterflies and moths. If I found a way to do that full time, I would be so happy, I would be so happy. If I could do this full time, and not have any other obligations. It would be the perfect form of escapism. I could ignore all of society's problems because I am not reminded of them. I'm just out here in nature with the flowers, with the butterflies. That's where I like to be. That's where I belong in a certain way. But also not. I won't deny my humanity. Being human is a responsibility, people. Being human means that you are a species that has a lot of power. A lot of power over the environment and a lot of power over other humans. 
your actions, your beliefs actually have a massive difference. Don't believe that you are superior and entitled to do anything you want without considering others and without considering the environment. Resources are not unlimited. And we are not above nature. We are not above the laws of nature. We are very much subject to them. Growth is not unlimited. Don't fill your pockets. Don't fill your pockets with things that cannot be replenished. I'm gonna stop now. I'm gonna stop now. Sound like an old man with dementia. Here's something to lighten the mood. Alcohol. Now I know I sound very drunk, but I, this is my first alcohol today, I promise. This rant is not the result of alcohol. Now a little bit of a alcohol disclaimer, because YouTube doesn't like it if I show alcohol to people. You're allowed to have it on YouTube, but just a disclaimer, because young people like to watch my channel. If you're under the drinking age, don't drink alcohol. I'm not promoting it. It doesn't make you cool, doesn't make you a tough guy. In fact, drinking alcohol too much kind of makes you a sad person. But once in a while, on a sunny day, on top of a hill with flowers, where you're just venting about life, it's okay to have a beer if you're a legal adult. If you're not, you're committing a crime. Don't drink. Cheers. Obligatory disclaimer. Because a lot of my audience are like 30, 14 year old people. And it's important to be responsible with alcohol. It's not funny, like it can ruin you. I, I like to give this disclaimer, right? Because I don't wanna seem like I'm promoting drinking on my channel, that would be weird. I feel like it needs to have some context. I don't make content for children, by the way, or teenagers. I make content for adults. And children should be supervised on YouTube anyway. But I know some of them happen to be watching. Maybe it's a good thing. I like it if young people are part of, like to watch content that revolves around nature. That's a good thing. I hope young people will be inspired by my channel. Hope they see the things that I film and they're like, wow, this is impressive. And maybe some of them will grow up to be like me. That's what I would like. I'm a true narcissist, aren't I? Giving myself as a good example to grow up as. Nah, don't grow up as me. I mean, grow up. I would like people to grow up like me when it comes to appreciating nature. Not when it comes to the rest of my personality, of course. Uh, I think it's still about time to move on. We had our very awkward lunch and uh, <laughs> me venting. Sometimes it's good, sometimes venting is healthy, man. Yeah. It's weird, but YouTube is like an imaginary friend to me sometimes. Like I'm talking to a lifeless object, a camera. But I know there's on the other side of the camera there's people watching me. The other side of the world. So you're kind of like a friend, even if, if you cannot talk back. So. That's how I like to think about it.
Bing, 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 There's no other one I'm over. enough words. It's time to get It's enough words. It's enough blah blah blah. Alright, I think that's enough uh, old man ranting here. Let's move on and uh, maybe see if we can get some nature in here perhaps. Although this is kind of like a park, there really isn't that much in this place. It should slowly start moving on to the next place, but we'll see, we'll see. We're not in a rush. Alright folks, here in the background we see the skyline of Teal. Now, it's not smart to share your address as a YouTuber, but Teal is the city I pretty much spend most of my life in. I know this makes it easy to find people. I'm a small YouTuber anyway, I don't think I have obsessive fans or stalkers yet. So, it's where I am. Teal is the area that I live. And I'm not afraid to say it on YouTube. Don't stalk me. If you go to my house, I will beat you. Okay. Anyway, let's go there because they recently opened what they call a butterfly park. I'm very curious to see this experiment. Let's go.
All right, people. Vlindertuin is the Dutch word for butterfly garden. We are in the butterfly garden that the local council has built in the city that I pretty much grew up in. I'm a little bit nervous about vlogging in public because people can hear me. We're inside of a city right now. Usually I'm in nature where no one can hear me talk, but this feels awkward. Anyway, let me turn the camera around and we see that this is basically a park in a city. But it's built for insects and butterflies, so... This has to be on my channel, right? So let's go. This right here is Budlaya. It's also known as Butterfly Bush. Is it doing a good job at attracting butterflies? I'm thinking yes. Let me show you some close-ups.
if you're really lucky, you can even see the hummingbird hawk moth here. Macroglossum stellatara. Turns out I'm really lucky because I just spotted one. Let me show you. Well, not bad, even if I say so myself. There's a lot of butterflies here for sure. Revealing where you live on YouTube, isn't that a stupid thing to do? Don't worry, I don't think I'm famous enough to have stalkers anyway. Besides, if the city where I grew up does a project like this, I think it deserves a little shout out on YouTube. Especially since a butterfly YouTuber happens to live near the city. That's it, short but sweet. If you want to stare at butterflies and you live in Teal, come take a look at the butterfly park. Why not? Maybe later this year in summer I'll go back to see if there's different species in other times of the year. Why not? I live here anyway, it's no effort for me. Ciao! Alright folks, it was better than uh, I anticipated and there, was, there were more butterflies than I anticipated. It's funny that when the council does something, I usually expect the worst. Because councils are usually run by out of touch boomers. So when they said butterfly garden, I was like, nah, these guys don't know how to make a butterfly garden. But I was surprised. It actually works. There was a lot of butterflies and uh, even hummingbird hot moths. Good job. Teal Council.
That's it ladies and gentlemen, I went back home and that means it is the end of this video. Hope you enjoyed it. I am back in my home country, the Netherlands. It's summer, so I'm not really going to make much outdoor videos this year because I've been making outdoor videos so much in Brazil in the rainforest. I was kind of tired and exhausted. But maybe if we have the free time, there are some few uh, nice options. Who knows? I think I have a few surprises in store for this channel this year. Stay tuned. I'm preparing some insect related things behind the scenes and I think you're going to enjoy them. Last but least I want to say this YouTube channel is demonetized by YouTube. If I upload a video, I don't make a single cent. I don't make a single dollar. That's right, I have almost 30,000 subscribers. I have uploaded over 1500 videos about insects. And YouTube has paid me zero dollar for all that effort. And they don't even want to say why I am demonetized. I email them and they don't, when they respond, they tell me, they don't want to tell me the rule or guideline that I have violated. YouTube is not transparent with the creators. It's unfair because it's people like me that keep YouTube alive. And in return, we just get shafted like that. It is a little bit unfair in my opinion. But I digress. What I really want to say is if you like my show, if you like these kind of videos and you want to see more, consider tipping or donating to my channel. Of course, this is only for those who are willing and able and those who see value in my content. I understand there's a lot of people who are not willing or who cannot afford it. That's fine. We're in an economic recession. I am not entitled to anything. Everyone is free to watch my videos. You don't have to give my, me anything. It doesn't make you less of a viewer if you don't, right? This message is only for those who are willing and able. But I am looking for people who can help, uh, help me sponsor this channel. Because the more budget I have, the more awesome things that I can do, the further that I can travel in my country to faraway places and maybe even other countries. It compensates for my time, my effort and my equipment. So if you like this show, if you like this channel, consider tipping or donating, becoming a member on my Patreon, my crowdfunding website, donating via PayPal or Ko-Fi. That's all I really wanted to say. I have to add this message to all of my videos. Because it's really how I run the show. So yeah, that was it. Hope to see you next time. There's some really interesting stuff coming up. Ciao, ciao.